Hello everyone, welcome to the first devlog of this game, which will be a mix between a survival sandbox, roguelike and RPG with boxes. I am currently using the old Minecraft textures because I thought it would be cool to see a clone at first, but it will be changed in the future devlogs. So first I will show you the current state of the game, with all the implemented features for now, and then I will explain the most important ones more in depth, so you can learn how they work internally. In terms of gameplay for now, it is pretty simple. We come up around in a procedural generated world, made of chunks that get loaded and unloaded. You can place and destroy blocks with a tool. A block can be normal, non-cubic, such as slabs, transparent, directional, stateable, checkable and random checkable. But also they can have behavior. These, are, these kind of blocks are called block entities, in which we can differentiate between interactable, tickable, random tickable and block entities with mesh and or texture animations. Same block can be in multiple types at the same time, so I think it is pretty complete with a lot of combinations for anything I want to do in the future. And now, let's begin with the more in-depth explanation of the important feature. We could load the whole world at once, so the player would be able to move around wherever he wants, but there is one problem there, as too many resources are needed for maintaining, processing, updating and drawing the whole world in screen. As you can see, we cannot have thousands or millions of blocks loaded at once, so we have to achieve the same result of freedom and open world without the player noticing what's going on behind the scenes. And to do that, we will split the world in chunks that will be handled individually and load it or unload it depending on the player's position. Only the chunks around the player will be loaded and the rest can remain inactive. With that, now we are only loading a limited number of chunks and the player does not see any discontinuity in the world, as it seems like he's walking in a fully loaded world. And also the terrain can be modified by placing or destroying blocks without updating all the mesh of the world but only a small amount of chunks. That would be enough, but we can make it a bit more complex and better for performance. But what we have now are loaded chunks, and some of them are not visible from the camera's perspective. So we will apply something called occlusion colic, which allows us to disable rendering of objects that are not visible by the camera. So to do that, we could differentiate from the loaded chunks between the non-visible and visible chunks. The visible distance is smaller than the simulated one, and it is not really exactly around the player because an offset is applied, depending on the camera's orientation. So we avoid rendering chunks behind the camera. That way we only draw some of the chunks that are loaded, but we can still update the non-visible to have stuff going on anyways. So we shift the same result as we had loading all the world at once, but only loading a small set of chunks and rendering even less chunks. There is still a lot of work to do in this system, as we have to load and unload chunks from disk to not have them loaded all in memory at the same time, but that will be for future devlogs. Now let's talk a bit about the rendering of the world. As we already know, chunks are a set of blocks. Each block is basically a cube. To render a cube, we give the UPU the position of the vertices, the UV coordinates, the normals and the triangles. So, if we know how to render a cube, we can do it for multiple cubes, to make a whole chunk. Now, we can render a chunk with a lot of cubes. But, there are some faces that are not visible for the player, that are being rendered. Let's take an example of an 8 plus 8 plus 8 chunk. There are 3072 faces, and most of them are not visible, applying what is called face calling. Before adding a new face, we check if there is a neighbor brook so we can avoid adding that face. Applying that simple condition for each face of a cube, we get 384 faces, and still the player won't notice any difference. Also, as the world is a group of chunks, we don't have to render the faces in the border of a chunk, so we reduce even more the quantity of faces being passed to the GPU for a single chunk. But now, what if we want to add transparent blocks? For that, we have to distinguish whether it's transparent or not transparent block before adding them to the mesh. Our mesh will now be a set of two sub-meshes, one for non-transparent and one for transparent blocks. 
then to draw them we will first render the first sub mesh and after we will render the transparent one and to handle directional blocks, we need to rotate the vertices on the normals depending on the block's orientation. How can we know the orientation of each block when updating the mesh? For that, we need to store the properties for each block. In this case, I store them in an assigned short number. And I implemented a flat system to store properties bitwise. For example, the facing property needs four different values, north, south, east and west. So, we only need two bits to know which direction that block is facing. A short is 16 bits long, so we can set the slots of the facing direction property for the first two less significant bits. For example, if the facing is north, we set it to 0, 0. If the facing is south, we set it to 0, 1, and so on. Now, when we update the mesh, we only have to read the property value for the facing direction of the specific block and rotate its vertices and normals depending on the direction. Blocks with states work in a similar way. We store for each stateable block its state in their properties. And when the mesh is being updated, we get the current state of the block and we draw the corresponding mesh and texture of that state of the block. To handle animated blocks, in, instead of updating all the mesh again, we just need to change the position in the world of the vertices or the UV coordinates of the animated block depending on the frame that its animation is in. And if it's between two frames, we can interpolate the position between the previous and the next frame, so we get a smooth animation. In my case, I have implemented linear interpolation, as I don't need any other type really. This way we get animated blocks without updating all the mesh and hence not affecting performance. The tick system allows to update the state of the game at a different rate from the frame rate. In Minecraft, for example, there are 20 ticks per second. In other words, the world is updated 20 times per second. So, I did pretty much the same. The problem here is that I, don't, I do not want to iterate through all the blocks of a chunk to tick even if they don't have a specific behavior. So, this is why I mentioned before the block entities. The block entity is basically a special block with a specific behavior or utility, such as storing data, updating its state, or having an animation. So a chest, for example, is a block entity. Now we can store these block entities in a chunk separately to update their state each tick. On the other hand, the tickable blocks are not tick like block entities each tick. They are queued to tick because other blocks require its update. For example, water can tick neighbor blocks to try to spread. So instead of the water block ticking all neighbors in the same tick, the tick petition will be added to the queue for the upcoming ticks. So, we don't overload one tick with all the updates. And what about randomness in ticks? We could generate a random number in a tick for a block that requires some randomness to behave. For example, to simulate crop growth or spreading grass. Instead of generating many random numbers each tick for each block, we can generate a set of random coordinates and just tick those blocks. With this, we have a limited amount of random numbers generated and we will achieve the same result. And that is why random tickable block entities and blocks exist more. And finally, let's talk a little bit about the fluid spreading. As I said earlier, when a block updates its state, the neighbor blocks are ticked to update its state as well. So this comes pretty handy for programming the water. When a water block is updated, it ticks the neighbor blocks. This works pretty similar to a cellular automata with specific rules to update the state of a block depending on the neighbors. I will not go into water spreading behavior because I don't really see a point nor difficulty to it. If you would like me to explain the rules for the spreading behavior, let me know in the comments. And that's it for this video, but before concluding it, I would like to ask you for your opinion about the edition, the animations and the format of the dev block. Would you prefer dev blocks focusing more on the process of development day by day and then doing a separate video with a more in-depth explanation? rather than this format of a quick update and then a more in-depth explanation after. Please let me know in the comments what do you think or whatever you want. Thanks for your attention and see you on the next devlog.